so Charlie Seminole. Okay, okay. Welcome on stage, Charlie. Yes, it's Charlie and his seminar. Enjoy. Yeah, so all of you know the, uh, the it, it won't be architecture, right? So this bridge thing I'm going to explain, and it won't be about actually building bridges and viaduct, but about how to turn your Amiga into an MS-DOS PC, because in case you didn't notice, in the last years, uh, there were quite a so-called DOS PC revival, can we call it that? So like there were multiple cool entries for really old PCs, and... Uh, yeah, so I think we Amiga guys have uh, some tools for that to really enjoy it. And uh, spoiler alert, this time I'm not probably not going to talk about your Amiga 500, although there are PC cards for that too. But for this box, oh, but for this box, which is uh, which is my Amiga 2000, which you can see here in the front, which has a billion expansion cards. Uh, uh, among one is an actual PC card, and I knew I forgot something. Uh, just a moment. So, now I do have everything. Talk about multiple fuck-ups. Um, yeah, but let's start and let's see where this goes. And of course, random excuse, last time I made my Amiga crash on the big screen. Let's hope we do that again because it's mildly amusing. And then people won't be bored. And there is, will be something to remember. So, actually, coming out, I'm a PC guy. <laughs> uh, for real. I mean, my, I only, as you can see on the slide, I got my first Amiga in 1999. I have two DOS PC demos released, which I contributed to. I've wrote mode players for the Gravis Ultrasound and Sound Blaster and just grew up with the DOS PC in general. And I only bought an Amiga first time because... Um, so it, it was looking like the DOS PC, which I liked, actually. I mean, it was primitive, like no argument there. But the little smartness which it was in there, it did relatively well, I think. And then Windows took over, which I hated, because it wanted to be smarter than it actually was. And uh, just told me what I can do with my computer instead, the other way around. So I just decided, I learned to accept that, okay, I will probably work with Windows machines as well. But I really want something to fiddle with at home. So I bought an Amiga uh, 1200. And it's like adopting stray cats. As soon as you have one, shortly you get another one. <laughs> so I got first an Amiga 4000T, uh, which is a completely different story, let's not mention it here. And later this actual 2000, which you see here. And it actually had a 286 PC, PC inside. Like, what? Like, how does this whole thing even come together? Let's look at it first. So, let's pretend we are Commodore. Circa 1985, uh, we have post tremulous sales disorder, uh, which means that they actually had a bunch of machines. I mean, Commodore 64 is still running strong, and uh, they just were looking for what to do next. In 85 was the year when the IBM PC sales and clone market sales skyrocketed really hard the first time. So of course, Commodore wanted to jump in on the two, and they just bought the Amiga which was groundbreaking, but they had absolutely no idea what to do with it. Like, that's, this is just in general always true with Commodore, that they had, for years to come, the best technology, which defined the future, and they just, like, no idea what to do with it. And, uh, yeah, so they decided it was the right thing to turn the Amiga, the next Commodore 64, and a budget PC. So they went at it. Uh, and yeah, so they just did that, made the Amiga IBM PC compatible. The C64 line, which eventually came through with the Amiga 500, ignore that for now, this is the other path. And first they made a software em emulator, 
uh, which was even presented at the Amiga, when they first introduced the Amiga in the, this infamous Lincoln Center presentation, which was like videos all over YouTube of it. And uh, they even demoed uh, like an IBM PC uh, emulator, uh, which you can run on your Amiga and run DOS productivity software with it, which was kind of important because the Amiga being a new platform had absolutely no software for it, or like very limited. Uh, but then they went further, and as you can see on this picture, uh, they added the so-called sidecar, which was actually a hardware XT implementation in it with some memory and so on. And yeah, the, the, it shared the keyboard, the mouse, well, the PC didn't know about mouse back then, but whatever. So it just shared a bunch of resources with the Amiga side, and you can run PC applications with hardware acceleration in a window. And this was a somewhat successful concept of like, uh, Okay, we have this powerful workstation-like machine, which was the Amiga, which is also good at games and whatever, and just add a bunch of productive software for it, for people who really need it. And need both words, like I just need my spreadsheet for my whatever budget, and I also want my Amiga because I'm a graphics artist or whatever. So, uh, they kept it as a concept for all the big box Amigas, like this Amiga 2000, this is the motherboard of this actual machine, which is, is in, you know, here in front of the stage. Um, so it has four ESA slots. So the, the right side of the motherboard is just uh, uh, an Amiga 500, basically. That's the Amiga 2000. It's a 500-bit expansion slot. On the left side, on the lower left side, you can see the Zoro slots, which are the Amiga native slots. And the upper left part, you can see the, these four ISO slots. There is also an arrow. There, you might notice where these slots are. So, uh, theoretically, you can plug in uh, normal ESA cards there. But there is a catch. Because uh, these ESA slots are inactive, so they don't work by default. They have power and ground, but no data lines, no address, no nothing is connected. So you need an additional PC card, which was basically just a sidecar on steroids, to activate this and use it. And by the way, this, this is true for all big box Amiga models. So like the coming, the, the 3000, 3000 tower, 4000, 4000 tower, it still always re remained tr like true. So this is one of these single board computers, basically, which you can, which you can plug in your Amiga and turn it into those PC. This is the last version, which you see here. Uh, but I actually have some earlier ones. Like, I can give these around if you want to take a look. So this is an XT card. This is on the first ones. Uh, yeah. It has a 4 megahertz whatever and, yeah, some memory. If you want to take a look, take it from the here. Uh, this is the 286. It was actually done in Germany, this design at least. Uh, it was done in the Commodore Research Center of Braunschweig, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, this is a monster double-layered sandwich card and whatever. And there are some more. Ah, this is another 386, which you can see on the screen if you want to take it from here. And yeah, there were, there were actually third-party cards. I already mentioned that they, they, uh, they ex there exist um, um, cards, for, for example, for the Amiga 500, which you can just plug it in the underside. Uh, that was never done by Commodore, that was done by third parties, companies. And this is another one which is not done by Commodore, and it uses the different software stack. So you can have these cards, for example, up to 486 something. So the, they started with an XT and you can upgrade it even to a 386.25 or even slightly faster. So this was the concept. You just buy an Amiga which has all the infrastructure prepared for a PC card and then you stick a PC in there. So let's take a look what this hardware can do. It's a real Amiga expansion card, which means it adds itself to auto config and you can just reach it to normal. Like there is a completely, it's not a, it's not a hack, right? So it doesn't try to take over your Amiga. It's a proper expansion card. You can just use it whenever you want it. Um, of course, the two sides can take, this is why these inline ESA slots became important, because if you notice, Two of those ESA slots are in like with Zoro slots, so this is where those cards go to. And uh, of course, during the Zoro, uh, through the, the through the Zoro interface, 
the two machines can talk to each other. Like the Amiga talk can talk to the PC and vice versa. It has half a megabyte of address space uh, through 128K of dual ported RAM. Uh, and this is the memory layout, which you can see there. So, e because the Amiga is like big NDN, Motorola 68K is big NDN, the Intel processor on the PC card is little NDN, uh, you have two different ways to access each other's memory. So, the byte access just means you have the same byte order on both sides. The word access means, so every 16 bit, the two bytes are reversed from the byte hardware. So, you don't need to do byte order swapping f uh, from, the, from, the, from the software side because the hardware can do it for you. The third bank is the so called graphics access, which is kind of neat. Uh, the hardware can actually assist the CG emulation. Um, or which the card can do, so it just pretends it has a hardware CGA card for the PC side, and uh, then it can assist whatever Amiga software takes care of it on the other side to, to, do, the, to, to do the CGA to Amiga software conversion, basically, like how, how you display this picture. So this graphics access means uh, if your PC in a graphics mode, uh, a CGA graphics mode, uh, it can hardware convert these graphics to Amiga bit planes. So whenever you want to do planar stuff on the Amiga side, of course this was designed for the original chipset, uh, then it's kind of simple because you basically you just have to copy data over and set some colors and you're done. That's the theory anyway. Uh, yeah, as I said or already, the, the hardware can do, supports all sorts of resource sharing from keyboard, which is basically means the Amiga can program what the PC sees as a keyboard uh, through the floppy disk controller, mouse, all sorts of ports, whatever. And, uh, and it activates the other ESA slots, which means you can use also normal uh, ESA cards. Like you can use an external VGA if that's your thing, uh, which is certainly an option, but I didn't like because it just, yeah, you need two monitors and it's, it's just like basically uh, having an external machine. So that, that wasn't my thing. And the fourth uh, thing is this IO space where all these external uh, like all these devices are programmed and whatever. So this is the, this is the fourth bank of the uh, alpha megabyte address space. So let's talk about the software. Uh, the soft, the Amiga side, the library, uh, the Amiga side software is called the Janus.library, which is, Janus is the, I think if, uh, it's a Roman god who has like two faces, facing two directions because of whatever. And, uh, yeah, so this kind of mimics this, uh, what you end up with. Uh, it has a services model, so whatever you, you want to serve uh, with your PC with on the Amiga side, you can just register it as a service. It has a certain format, how you need to change data, whatever, and then you can just register it and the PC can call it. I'm, let me make you an example. Um, for example, the mouse, right? Or uh, even better example, if actually the disk access. So the PC BIOS extension just calls into an Amiga service, right? Because, yeah, for the BIOS, BIOS PC interface is just something transparent. Doesn't matter what happens below that layer when the, the, they call into the hardware uh, or like the BIOS uh, for DOS and then it can do all this magic. And as I wrote on the slide, it's, it has some quite neat features for 80s hardware. Uh, for example, the PC can boot from a hard disk image on the Amiga hard drive. So that's kind of cool, I think. And something which some detec in implies technologies which we usually associate with much newer hardware. Um, so it, all in all, it has a really good concept, uh, but the implementation is obsolete, right? So uh, it's generally designed, I mean, Amiga OS uh, and Amiga DOS got a big, big rewrite in Amiga DOS 2.0, so Kickstarter 2.0 and above. And this thing was designed to run with the older one because, I mean, it predates the Amiga DOS, uh, Amiga OS 2.0. So it does a lot of shady things, which is not really good practice. And it has a pile of bugs. I mean, trivial bugs. For example, just to make an example, the largest hard drive image you can make is 32 megabytes because there is a 16-bit multiplication overflow while making the image and things like that. So it has a bunch of problems. Let's talk about pain. Uh, the number one application uh, is which you can use this PC through is called PC Window. 
and it sucks, especially with an expanded Amiga like this one. I mean, this one has a, I mean, it's an Amiga 500 as a start, as I said, and it's basically expanded with how far you can an Amiga 2000 expand without soldering. It has an 060 accelerator with 128 megs of RAM, SCSI, network, graphics card, which is basically, yeah, just higher resolution, and more colors, and everything. And it doesn't play nice with that. Um, the color mode only works in full screen. And yeah, it just generally really feels like an application from 25 years ago or even more where you were like, uh, I don't really like to touch this again <laughs> in general. And it has a huge blocker issue for me, quite literally a blocker issue, because somewhere in the system there is a keyboard programming issue. As, as I said, normally the, the Amiga side feeds some key codes into the PC side so you can program the keyboard. And uh, this has a bug somewhere because the PC tells back to the Amiga, okay, I need another key code. And this whole mechanism, as I learned later, uh, has an issue where this notification that I, you can feed me more key codes just never arrives. I still don't know why. It could be a hardware issue, it could be somewhere in the software, it could be something that this XYANUS library doesn't play nice with the expanded Amiga, but it happens from using the PC for 40 seconds to 10 minutes, but it will just always happen, and then you have to reboot the entire system because the Amiga side software locks up, so that's not very nice. And uh, the result, uh, it basically kills the fun of fiddling with this thing, right? Because it's, you don't really want to use this for serious stuff, but, I mean, when it's something completely crashes, it just kills the fun of even trying. So, uh, as the bridge was clearly not enough, let's build a viaduct. Spoiler alert, uh, viaduct is the name of this alternative PC application which I wrote and gonna demo later. Uh, so yeah, uh, how hard can it be? Hold my beer, I got this. It means I basically have all the knowledge to make this really easy, which was probably more difficult for more people. As I said, I had a PC background. I do programmed the DOS PC enough. And in the past 20 years, I spent a lot of time programming system-friendly code for Amiga. For example, the, co uh, the compiler, which I crashed on big screen last year, and things like that. Um, so I wrote this for myself because I wanted to fiddle with it. But it, as it turned out, it's already used, useful for more, more people. And really, I just wanted something which can display text mode reliably, color text mode in a workbench window, no fuzz, no big deal, easy, right? Uh, and then, of course, it's escalated quickly. So, how to actually proceed? How was the first version came to be? Uh, I fiddled around with some hardware before. Actually, that, that card, like the 386 card, which is on the table there. Sorry, I got a cold. So, I tried to revive this through software because that has some problems, so Janos library doesn't load. And, uh, yeah, I actually managed to poke into the, some registers on the card, and then it actually semi-boots, but it's really, ooh, something really weird going on there. So I actually gave up, got another card. Um, so I just had this P FPC ID. If you remember last year, it like, looks like Turbo Pascal running on an Amiga window. And I had that, which is basically has everything which I needed. So I just hacked that rendering code out of there and hardwired up an address which looked like a text mode in the PC memory and then I realized it's a wrong endian so I just reversed the byte order and it was almost working which I was quite happy about and it was motivation for, for the further madness. So yeah, but you, you needed to, needed to like, uh, this was also, of course a quick hack, it didn't up a keyboard, you still needed PC window running in parallel to to like give you keyboard access, whatever. Um, so I integrated it as a proper Janus library application. Yeah, just general cleanup, no busy looping, checking for differences, uh, using this Janus signals, which I mentioned before. Um, rewrote the text mode rendering a few times. Uh, cursor emulation, and yeah, keyboard support. And there's a big, big fail hit when it turned out the, I managed to reproduce the exact same keyboard issue, which, which why I started this whole endeavor, which was kind of demotivating. Uh, actually, I think a few things needs clarification here because I'm skipping in ahead. Uh, like the, this whole display emulation works like you, 
Basically, the hardware pretends for the PC side, as I said, that you have a real hardware CGA or MDA card. And then, from then on, uh, you get interrupts or signals on the Amiga side, basically, and then you just have to re read out the register content and decide what to do. Basically, you do need to do the whole rendering yourself, right? If it's, if you have to detect if it's in text mode or graphics mode, use different rendering codes depending on which way you want it to go and all sorts of things. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is, for example, you have to emulate the cursor, not just like the shape of it, which is programmable on the text mode screen, but also like how fast it blinks, the blinking itself. I mean, the, the Amiga doesn't have support for that. So it, you have to like constantly re-render just that one character and things like that. Uh, yeah. So we were at the, uh, yeah, that uh, I run into this fail because the keyboard didn't work. So, but I was lucky enough, so I managed to find the workaround for this issue, not, not uh, much later. Uh, basically, if, if, you really, if you really want to go into technical terms, I'm not sure how many coders are in the audience, but the whole story is that uh, the whole story is that there is a register which tells you when a PC, when the PC finished processing an interrupt, including the keyboard interrupt, because how you program the key codes is that you write a value, write, write the PC key code in a register, and then you trigger the the, the interrupt which will handle it, right? So that's a separate step. And uh, sometimes this ne you never get an answer to this, right? It just sits there forever. You never receive a signal. But you can additionally, if enough time have checked, uh, have passed, sorry, uh, you can check this register and see if the PC is still processing this interrupt, if it's still pending. And if it's still pending, uh, you just yeah wait more. If it if it had, if uh, if it actually has ended processing the interrupt, then you can just feed another key code, which finally unlocks the whole system, so you get the f notifications again. So it just has a glitch somewhere which you don't get one uh, notification sometimes. So, and then I decided, okay, uh, let's do graphics mode support and let's rewrite the text rendering again because it turns out CGA also supports 40 times 25 characters which no one ever support, not, nothing ever used on a PC, but hey, that's me, I can do it, so why not? And I also, uh, kept working on MDA support. Uh, MDA is the text-only graf graphics card for the PC, which even predates CGA, or was the cheaper option, high resolution option, whatever. And um, it has some more tricks, which is for professional applications. So it can do underline in your text and high resolution and stuff like that. And for example, it's used really useful because in theory, it only uses like four colors in a sense of black and three shades of gray. Uh, so, in theory, that could also work on, uh, for example, on an ECS Amiga, so without a graphics card. So, I wanted to keep that option because the, the other, other, other thing that just doesn't have enough colors. So, so let's do. Uh, let, so, what was this, this slide is actually about how difficult was the graphics mode get to run? Because the primary pain point is that there is no direct bleed function, bleed function in the uh, Amiga OS or in the. Uh, RTG drivers to RTGs. Okay, uh, one other clarification. RTG means just Amiga with a graphics card. It's actually the, it actually stands for retargetable graphics. Retargetable in a sense that you can decide where your workbench will appear and your graphic UI elements because it's not only on the graphics chipset, so it's retargetable. Uh, anyway, so it, they, they don't support the combination of bleed you need because if your Amiga runs in even in a graphics card, for example, 256 colors, and you have four color image which the, pa the, the four colors which belong to that image can be all over the palette of this, this screen because it's shared with other applications. So there is no single bit function which we can take this CG image and just slam it on the screen for you. And so, yeah, there are a bunch of other things which is, you, has to, you have to consider. Uh, ideally, you want to scale the CG image because 300, even if my Amiga workbench, even with the graphics card, which actually from 1997, so 20 year olds, 20 years old in itself, uh, run, uh, runs in relatively low resolution, uh, like 10, 24 times 7, 6, 8, um, three ti three ti uh, 320 times 200, which is the normal CGA graphics resolution, would be really small on it. Or if you use the mono CGA mode, which is 640 times 200, that would be completely squashed because the pixel size 
yeah, it's just all wrong. So, um, and of course, you cannot just read it out, convert, scale, whatever with the CPU, then try to push it to the graphics card because this, I mean, it's still an Amiga 500, so its bus, bus system is limited to around 5 megabytes per second at best. So, if you want to just scale to a high resolution multicolor bitmap and push it through the like the bus from the CPU side, even with the X, like just, there's just not enough, uh, not enough bandwidth for reasonable uh, performance. So I applied a bunch of planar scaling tricks, which is like why the CGA bitmap is still in CGA. I mean, I yeah, I let's. I'm if you are coders and actually curious, I can talk <laughs> talk more in detail about this talk because it's really boring. Uh, there were some nice tricks in there. Basically, the thing is, I copy the bit planes one by one into the graphics memory and just draw all the colors color by color because then you only transfer one bit at a time, not like the whole pixel, which is eight bytes, for example, for a 266 byte screen, uh, 56. So, yeah. And I also added Delta rendering rater, which just means I search because a lot of the all the PC games don't refresh the whole screen, right? They just animate this whole figure, which is jumping around. So it completely doesn't make sense to copy all the time, all the way, uh, these unchanged parts of the screen. I mean, I still have to check on the PC card itself, but if there is no change on the screen, you don't need to push data into the graphics card. And uh, yeah, there is a bunch of details, like CGA supports five different, very, or six even, very ugly palettes, and it has a background color, which everyone just ignores, so that's another color, and yeah, it's programmable, not just always black and things like that. So it was a quite of a challenge, but I'm quite proud of the results and I will demo them later, so bear with me. Demo! Let's switch over to the Amiga 2000 and let's remember still what I wanted to show you. Yay, Amiga! Okay. Can you break? Yeah. It's kind of underwhelming. MS DOS, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, let's let's do some fun. Let's reboot the PC. So as you can see, it loads these, uh, yeah, it, it is. Fine, fine, thank you. Uh, so as you can see, these are, actually it boots really slowly because the flop is not controlled, so not connected, so it's just waits for it forever. As you can see, it loads the, uh, the Janus handler, which is the aforementioned like BIOS, BIOS extension, and then it just now it waits for the floppy, which never answers, and eventually it boots from the hard drive. It also has a BIOS setup, which is kind of fun. Uh, but it's just a very primitive, like one screen, black and white, so you can. Yeah, so this is how it looks when MS-DOS boots on your Amiga. And then you can load into, you just use it as a normal PC, right? So you can, for example, load DOS Navigator, and just, yeah, it works normal. Like, you can play Tetris and shit, right? So. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, there was a question. Oh, by the way, I forget to mention, of course, because I forget every days. Uh, like, if you have any questions, just interrupt me, because otherwise I'm just babbling and it's probably m more boring. Yeah. I mean, it's slightly related to what Zaga Music says, the Mao, that uh, Mao asks, uh, Zaga Music says, can, can I make it run Doom? Uh, is there a Doom which supports CGA mode? Pro prob probably someone can make it. Uh, then yes. So actually, I'm, I'm going to show it later. So the other question was like, would it make sense to run 256 bytes in transfers? Well, the thing is, this is not really an ideal config for any sort of PC demo scene thing, especially not like here running on an Amiga workbench, because most of the PC scene is for VGA. 
So it's actually really hard to find advanced application, which even if it just uses text mode, it still does, I mean, CGA doesn't even support redefinable character set. Like, it, you just get this character set and done. So I could hardwire it in the application, and if even a text mode application does it in a VGA card, uh, you cannot run it, because it will just say, hey, I'm not supporting this. So that's thing. Uh, actually, to, to show some more uh, things, um, uh, Trickster, uh, who is in fa famous and infamous from 8088 domination and corruption demos and is 8086 miles per hour, one of the lead coders of that, wrote this CGA compatibility tester application. I'm now about to boot up. Uh, yeah, it will break your card. And then you can just test all sorts of things. I mean, uh, even in the CG emulation, this is not, compl not complete because there's a lot of things in the CGA. Uh, uh, where what, uh, here? Ah, yeah, this is. Um, so even even in the CGA, there are a lot of tricks you can do, and it's really hard to emulate. And there is like composite. For example, not many people know that old CGA uh, supported composite colors, so it has a composite output, which where you can do 16 colors things and whatever, and that would be easier. And I mean. Because the hardware doesn't support emulation, the VG, uh, emulation of even an EGA or a VGA card, uh, I can There is nothing to react on an Amiga side, and uh, pretending on the Amiga side that something pro tries to program a VGA card on the PC side is super hard. Like that, it's not feasible. So anyway, uh, CGA, yeah. So it just supports. This is like direct register writes on the on the PC side, and uh, it, you can change the. Uh, medium res palette. So this is the old and nice palette colors, which CGA supports, in case you were wondering. But it looks nice on an Amiga Workbench, right? So, uh, actually, it's a complete multitasking application. I mean, up here, this uh, this uh, CPU usage monitor is actually upside down. So when it's when its graph is on the top, then it's the CPU is idle. It's it's not doing anything unless it has to. Uh, uh, I don't know what else there was. Of course, I don't support uh, medium res background. Do I support that? Of course, I do. Yay, 16 colors. So yeah. And uh, okay, uh, yeah. So that was that. It supports most of but uh, CJ support. Uh, so this machine is actually, as I can show it to you, system information. I think work. Yeah. So it's a 386 SX running at 20 megahertz, and yeah, in general. It doesn't know about the floppy disk and whatever. It has eight megabytes of RAM, which is plenty. Actually, there's a hardware hack for it where you can, where you can uh, uh, add 16 megabytes even for ab for absolutely no reason, but you can do it. So uh, let's have some more fun. Yes. No. Hmm. Oh. This shit had a. Never mind, do something else. I, I remember this. So this will even have sound because as you said as I said, Ah yeah, there we go. I have an SB16 in the machine, which is just uh, yeah, it's running in an ad lib mode right now. Actually, it's even really hard to find these old games, which the Sound Blaster would properly support it, because it's mostly... Eh? So. It's just, it's not a very... Ah, okay, so what I forgot to mention during the demo, as you can see now, while displaying the static screen, the CPU is like almost fully utilized. This is actually, I mean, it's it's quite funny. While developing this application, I found a bunch of bugs in PC applications which affected the emulation in quite funny ways. This is because the Indianapolis 500, as it turns out, doesn't wait for the vertical blank by displaying the menu screen. So it just always writes to the memory from the PC side, which means the Amiga has no time to read it out. I, I, I profiled this, and it's actually the read instruction which is like this one move instruction which waits for the PC card to read out the data that slow. There isn't everything else is super fast. Like 
there is no, there is no way to optimize it. The, the Omega side is just waiting for the PC to do something finally. Which kind of pattern if you Ah haha. Let's play some games, shall we? Exactly. Someone wants to come here and play better? Be my guest. Anyway, enough fun of this. As I said, if you have more questions, pro prehistoric, I mean, the, this keyboard workaround which I found is not perfect. I mean, I still have ways to improve it. Uh, uh, it's one of those uh, applications where the keyboard still stuck sometimes, so it's really easy to die because you just walk into directly to the dinosaur. But it actually runs uh, Prince of Persia. Maybe like this? Does it blink or does it crash? It, I think it crashed. Oh, if it's not blinking, it's dead. Because this thing actually detects the sound blaster and then crashes for unknown reason if you don't specify the right parameter, which I forgot what was it for the ad lib, so never mind. Uh, so, and the funny thing is, you can reboot the PC card, but it doesn't reinitialize the ISA cards for whatever reason, because this thing just has a bunch of bugs. So the, PC, the DMA of the sound blaster keeps running in the background and just overwrites whatever in the memory. So not on, the, not on the Amiga side, but the PC side. So after this, you actually have to restart the whole system. So can you turn the PC volume down, please? Because I have to turn it off. They didn't. <laughs> yes? Uh, I mean, the hardware was also buggy. I mean, it had a billion, like, I mean, Commodore ship BIOS updates uh, in, like, actual chips, which you had to swap on the card. I mean, no idea. They just never got it right. I guess Commodore was always starved on development resources, especially software. Uh, they had a much more hardware development resource than they should have, I think, and they just employed too few software engineers, which actually had its good sides, because nothing makes more mess than a software engineer who has too much free time on their hand. But, uh, yeah, it, in some cases, they just couldn't fix it. Actually, some of, to my knowledge, some of the, like, RG Mikal, for example, like, one of the original Amiga engineers was working on this, and it still became buggy. It still remained buggy. So, oh, whatever. Uh, where the hell? So, okay, so actually, uh, to, to progress a bit further, uh, To progress a bit further, uh, you can actually download this version on Aminet right now. So I released this. This is already released in back in July. I was working on a lot on a version uh, up until yesterday evening, which actually would have run in full screen and whatever. Because even if I mean the original can run in full screen, but it's still on the Amiga uh, chipset. So if you only have a graphics card and you don't want to use m two monitors, it's actually kind of difficult to. Uh, yeah, to avoid that. So it would still make sense to run it in full screen and a bunch of other like keyboard, still improvements to that keyboard mess and whatever. But actually, uh, yeah, I'm, al I'm almost finished, so yeah. Mo was just updating me for whatever. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna, f if you wanna see Prince of Persia running after the talk, I'm going to go there, go back to my table, and you can see it if you're curious for whatever sick reason of yours. Future plans. 
yeah, as I said, full screen support. Uh, I finally want to release this next version, which I promised like many times, and I kept bumping the release date in the source, uh, and they just never make it because there, or there is always something more important or whatever. Uh, this is, I still consider this more of a tech demo because as you could see, the window you cannot really resize and uh, yeah, there is just still a bunch of issues with it. Um, I, I want to open source it eventually, hopefully. Um, I mean, it's, it's written in free Pascal, so I doubt it will be pretty much useful for everyone else except me, but maybe, who knows. Uh, it actually uses quite a lot of the free Pascal infrastructure, which I demoed, la demoed last year. For example, it uses the threading. So this thing runs three threads in, the, in parallel, one for the main application, one for the UI updates, and one for the keyboard. So it's a heavily multi-threaded application, and free Pascal actually made it super simple, so this was just another because it was one line and it was working and it never crashed, so yeah. Um, and just in general, whatever. I mean, I constantly get requests for like implement VGA and this CGA composite mode, which I would consider, but it's actually quite complicated for reasons. Um, blah, blah, blah. If you have questions, probably this is the right time because we arrived to the questions. And as you can see, you can download it here and yeah. Subscribe, don donate to me on Patreon, whatever. <laughs> Come again? In 85? In 85 was the Amiga released. The first, the first guy, I think it was 86 or, I mean, the, the sidecar was 86 maybe. Thinking, I, I, I don't, un, I, I don't get. It. Ah, okay, yeah. So the question is, what happened to this whole thing? So. Commodore was a totally disorganized company. So at one point around 92, I, they pushed this whole concept until 92. So this 386 card was actually released in 92. This was the last one. They never updated the concept, but they still released new Amiga models, like newly introduced Amiga models, like the Amiga 4000T, which still had these ESA slots. So like you couldn't buy the card anymore, but like there were no software updates after 92, but they still released Amigas with these slots, so like, who knows? Com it was just Commodore, right? So you, you, you observe these things and you say, it's Commodore. <laughs> post terminal Commodore anyway, which was a uh, yeah, just completely disorganized company, as I said. Any more questions? That's underwhelming. I like you too. Uh, thanks for your attention. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Charlie. That was quite educating and entertaining. So if you want to port Doom to CGA to let it run on an Amiga, uh, please go ahead. And uh, what's up next? Uh, Compose, maybe. The timetable says 20 o'clock. I'm not sure we'll be able to keep that, so I will just play you some music and I will return once uh, we really start with the compost. Until then, have a nice evening.